Yeah, so thanks everyone for staying. Uh, I know last talk of the day, many people want to I mean, go back home, but since it's remote anyway, I guess most people are already home or um, still at work or whatever, so maybe not that much uh, of an issue. Um, so yeah, I'll be having a good um, a good conference so far. Uh, let me put the slide back up. Yep, cool. Um, so today we'll be talking about how to build a remote Scala team. Of course, um, there isn't that much specific to Scala on that that's actually applicable to pretty much any uh, any software team, but um, uh, it works for Scala team as well. Um, first, why me? Uh, so I've been working remotely for 10 years, so full, full, full time remotely for 10 years. Um, while currently I am the VP engineering at Weltan, uh, and we are a 100% remote company. Previously, I've worked either as the sole uh, remote engineer on teams um, or mixed place as well. So I've seen pretty much all type of environment uh, where remote is applicable. Um, also, I'm doing some mentoring specifically about remote on the Plateau HQ platform. So I'm seeing different scenario that I don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so more precisely, what will I be talking about? So splitting my talk into uh, five different aspects. So the first one is why remote tech makes sense. And um, of course, there is the coronavirus right now, but that will hopefully not last forever. So remote uh, it makes sense even when there is not a pandemic around. So why remote team makes sense. Um, after that, where to look for remote talent. So if you want to actually build a remote team, uh, is there any difference to, uh, if you want to search for people willing to take on a remote position? After that, we'll be discussing the interview process. Again, many of that thing uh, is applicable whether it's remote or not, but I will focus on remote specific things. Once we're done with the interview process, we'll move to the onboarding. So initial first days of uh, someone new on your team. And if you keep doing that, you end up with a team. So you have more than just you, you have other people with you after a few onboarding. So how to create a great culture so the team can uh, be productive and keep going on as the time goes by. Um, I have the, the QA uh, panel open. So if at any point anybody has question, feel free to ask them there. Um, I don't see the chat. I'm not sure why. Uh, since I started to share, I just see the QA, not the chat section. So if there is a question, please use the QA. Um, otherwise, I will answer them at the end. But if I can, I will try to answer them. I like uh, just one thing, I think your mic might be brushing your lapel and we're getting a little better like that. Better um, like Maybe. Is it? Yeah, I will try it there. Yeah, seems good, thanks. Okay, cool, sorry about that. Okay, um, yeah, so first, um, why remote team makes sense? Yeah, let's get a slide. Uh, First reason is obviously uh, by going remote, by allowing your, your company and your team to hire people uh, remotely, you open a much bigger talent pool than if you limit to your own uh, geography. Uh, those number, of course, uh, is not that precise, but um, in New York for a software engineer, if you compare the software engineer in, in uh, New York compared to the world, this is just 0.9% of the software engineer, engineering talent that exists by going remote, you can tap into this big uh, red portion. So much more people that you can, you can IR. And um, the same is actually true for people looking for job actually. So you also get access to much more opportunity. If you, in addition to looking for job around uh, where you live, you also will look for remote opportunities. So you increase the, it works both ways, but you end up increasing the talent pool uh, a lot. Um, also reduce competition in a way because uh, it, when you want to hire only locally, you have to fight with the other uh, company around for the small pool you have. But when you go uh, to hire from anywhere in the world, 
there is not that many opportunity. The, the opportunity are not spread equally in, in the world. So there is much more software engineer, engineering job in like New York, the Bay Area, or any uh, um, like large uh, city that has a, a lot of software development happening. But there are people elsewhere in the world that can also um, apply to you that otherwise would not have good job locally. So you have a lot more people, a few, and a lot less competition for those talent as well. The other great uh, thing with a remote team is that it unlocks a lot of benefit that you otherwise cannot really have in office. Um, so, and showing some uh, data from a state of remote report from 2019 about what people like about working remotely. And this is all stuff that you cannot do much if you, have, if you really focus on the office. Yes, you can have a bit of flexible schedule. Like people can come in one, two, three hour difference, but otherwise you're still relatively fixed. Um, but when you go fully remote, you can actually offer a real flexible schedule being if someone want to work, want to work from um, midnight to eight in the morning, I mean, fine, can do that. That doesn't impact the productivity or anything like that because your whole team will be set up to work this way anyway because there is people from all over the world. So you get a lot more benefit uh, for everyone beside uh, ping pong table and, and whatnot. Um, and the advantage of having all those extra benefits is that create a lot more happiness for your employee. So employee will be happier. Um, Besides, of course, everybody wants to be happier. Uh, everybody wants to be happy. That said, um, there is direct correlation between productivity um, and also uh, there is a direct correlation between productivity when uh, employee are happier, they're more productive. They also take, take a lot less sick days off because sometimes you don't go to the office. I mean, that's, that's pretty much uh, what we are seeing right now. So with the, the, the coronavirus. So if you are just a bit sick, you might still want to go to the office and spread the disease around. Whereas if you could work from home, I mean, fine, you can still work. You're not that bad, but um, um, you don't take a sick day. You can keep them from uh, sick days off for when it is really uh, relevant. The other thing as well is regarding turnover or people uh, quitting job, doing job hopping. There is a lot less of that happening when people work remotely. And uh, there is data uh, behind that in science. But biggest reason is because employees are happier because of the greater flexibility and other factor. But it remains that people are more happy when they work remotely. So they stick around for longer with the company. So, which is also good for, uh, for your team you don't have to train new people, but also for business because hiring people is uh, time consuming and costs a lot. Now, so you decided you want to actually build a remote team, um, maybe a full remote or hybrid remote, or just say, hey, we still have a local team, but if you work remotely, then we're fine. So where do you look for remote talent? Of course, you can keep looking at the same place as you would be looking normally. So anywhere you are posting job, especially if you are also, if it's not remote only that you are looking for, but also uh, you have an office, um, then keep posting the regular place definitely makes sense. So all the regular job boards, um, any Scala specific community uh, forum is a good place too. Um, also looking at like minority specific communities. So there is some job board specifically for women, job board specifically for uh, veterans, etc. So it's good to keep looking at that. So not limit yourself to remote only because this is still the, the place where you might get the most uh, applicant anyway. That said, especially for software engineer, uh, there is two platforms that are particularly good if you're looking for remote because they do a really great job at filtering and promoting remote, uh, remote jobs, remote opportunity. Um, AngelList and Stack Overflow, they are also popular anyway, so it's not that remote specific again. But um, as someone that was mostly only searching for remote job myself, this is the first two places I look at because filtering is good for that. So, um, and of course, I'm not the only one that did notice it. So anybody that is software engineer and looking for remote work, is always looking at those two places first most of the time. So 
it's good to, to, to put it out there on those two platforms. The third place to look for if you are serious about hiring remote people is those, um, there is a few remote specific job boards. So they only put position if it is for a remote first company. So again, it's a good place. Um, for software engineering, mean, they're also not focusing only on software engineers. So yes, they have a lot of position open and people are, are applying there, but they are not only focusing on software engineer. Um, but as time goes by, those will definitely get it more and more popular with the popularity of remote work. So it's still a good place uh, to look for, but I would not necessarily recommend to, to use just that because you might be disappointed. Um, but still, best of those, uh, remote okay, we work remotely and remote.co are um, pretty good for that. So definitely worth posting there if you are looking for remote, uh, remote talent. Okay, so now that you decided to go remote, you started to post job at some like, various uh, job board, LinkedIn and whatnot. Uh, starting to get applicant, you need to do interview process. Now you might have already an interview process in place for in-office uh, interview, but doing that remotely, you need to do a few things differently if you really want to, uh, the process to be uh, efficient and work well for you. So the first thing is to prepare for that. I mean, that sounds uh, obvious, but I've seen a lot of company, they don't really prepare specifically for the remote process. So when it starts, um, they end up interviewing people and reaching like end of the interview process and they wonder what they should do about that. So much better to prepare before ends, before you actually even start the interview process. So the first candidate you get, they can also get a good experience and you can uh, like get good interview data from the beginning. So uh, I will dig into those four points, but basically, um, you have to think about what your process will be just overall. Uh, you have to think about compensation. So this is kind of a really important aspect that people forget. So when you go with a remote position, compensation, it doesn't necessarily work as you'd expect. Um, also, you have to think about what is important for you. Uh, and I put an emphasis at that because remote uh, needs some different skill maybe than what you would get in the office. And also, how do you want to evaluate those candidates? So first thinking about your process. So you have to actually think about your own process, which step do you have? So like, do you have technical interview? Um, some place, even if they have remote position, they do an on-site interview anyway. So they will fly people in, even for remote position. So you need to think about that first. Um, and so all those steps, it's important to have them ready because especially for remote interview, it's really good to share all that information with people when they apply. When you start the interview process, if you want to go with a candidate, it's really good to share all the steps um, before you start in. So the candidate, they know what they are getting into, they know what to expect, they know how long it will take and what that. So especially because compared to uh, in-office interview, frequently you end up with maybe a phone interview, maybe stuff during one day and that's kind of it so it can go relatively quickly once you get in office when you do that remotely it will more frequently end up being spread on uh, multiple days to accommodate everybody's schedule so you have to, to like if you share your process before end that definitely help the candidate know what to expect um, for the same reason if you have your process it's good to know who will be asking why uh, who, who will be asking what type of question so we will be covering the technical aspect of people. We will be covering the culture fit, uh, that kind of stuff. So you don't repeat the same question between multiple people and you get a good feedback. Um, the final thing to think about for your process is who end up making the final decision. So some place they will do with a democratic process. So it's just you vote. And if you get enough vote, you get hired. Uh, other place, basically everybody need to be, everybody need to agree to hire a new candidate. Um, anyone can veto someone. So that's one way to do that. Other place, uh, like every interviewer will just give feedback to most likely the hiring manager. But in the end, it's the hiring manager that will decide who they want to hire. 
So you have to think about that before starting the whole process. So it help, uh, it help especially people that do the interview, so the interviewer, so they know what to expect, what their feedback will be used for. Um, and it also helps because if you wait until you have a few candidates to decide how you decide about them, it's easy to bias the process uh, and have bias depending on the candidate you get. And this is not a situation you want to have. So by setting it all clear before, it's much better. Now, I did mention that compensation for a remote position is kind of a bit tricky. Um, so this is not something you think that much when you have just in office position, because most of the time the salary and stuff, I mean, it, it depends on the locale, the average salary uh, of wherever you are. So of course, bigger salary in the Bay Area in New York City, smaller salary in a, a other place, but people kind of know that. There is not much contention around it. Um, everybody kind of agree on that. That says, when you go remote, it brings the question. If you are ready to, uh, if you open a software engineer position and you are willing to pay 200,000 to 150,000 uh, a year in New York, if you hire someone for the same role because you open it remotely that live in the Midwest or maybe live uh, in India or uh, South Africa or Europe, anywhere, do you give the same compensation? It's not, a reason, it's not a question of do you have the money to pay for that? Because if the person decides to relocate to New York, you're fine with paying the price. So it's really just a question of what do you consider to be uh, a fair compensation uh, scheme? If you search on the internet about that, you will see people argue both ways. So some people say it's more fair to vary the compensation based on the local cost of living. So yeah, I'm willing to pay 300,000 for an engineer in the Bay Area, but because you decide to live in Montana, we'll give you only 100 instead, so, but that's fair. So some people argue that way. Other people think that no, if the company is uh, willing to pay a certain amount for that position, someone should be able to get that wherever they are because it's produced the same output um, the person is filling the position, so you should not vary the, the salary based on locale. So it's kind of sensitive, people agree it both ways, but again, it's much better to think about that before you start interviewing candidate. Um, because yeah, that, this is a question that candidate will, um, will be asking, so it's good to think about it. Um, the other point about the interview that is really important to think is what is the most important for you? So normally, especially for the software engineer, engineering position, a lot of place, they put a lot of emphasis on technical uh, skills, which of course is important. But when you have remote, uh, remote people, I believe that there is other stuff that are at least as important, if not more. Um, of those, great communication skill, and I'm not talking about um, accent. I mean, I know I'm not a native English speaker, so I do have an accent, but that's not what I'm meaning. It's mostly, um, can people get their point across? Uh, are people comfortable uh, arguing about things with other people? Are they able to argue uh, in a way that don't have everybody be angry after that? Um, so. Are, are they able to ask questions if they are in trouble? Do they feel comfortable doing that? Do they feel comfortable saying, I don't know, I need help? All that kind of stuff in a remote environment is much more important than in the office. So this is something you really need to focus on when doing uh, the interview process. The other aspect regarding skill you should be looking for is a can-do attitude, especially if you go with remote that is um, not just, yeah, we are still all in New York, it's just we don't have an office, we work from our home, so all the same time zone. If you go with fully uh, distributed across the world, um, you have people that don't have much time overlap, they will not be working at the same time. So you need to have people on your team that uh, are willing and they feel comfortable um, managing their own schedule, making sure they have stuff to do, even if the internet goes down, um, making sure they feel comfortable and empowered to 
not wait, uh, not wait to get feedback from other or always asking, can I do that? Am I allowed to do that? So you need to have people that um, they are, uh, they have a can do attitude. So they can make decision, feel comfortable with it, go with that, not necessarily wait all the time after everybody else, because otherwise they, they cannot work uh, correctly in a remote environment that way. Finally, and um, a, a bit same as for the fact that it's important always, even in office, but remotely uh, hiring people that you feel you can trust, it's much more important because you don't see them. So um, they are not in the office, they are at home right now. So are they actually working? Are they playing games? Are they uh, doing a remote virtual conference from home? Because uh, nobody knows they are doing that. So can you trust them when you don't see them? It, it's a bit, many people have uh, find it harder to do that than when in the office, even if I believe if someone wants to Slack and just play games, they can do that in the office anyway. It's super easy to do. But for some reason, people trust, uh, have an easier time to trust that when in office you are working. But so if you are at home, suddenly, oh, must be watching TV all day. So if you cannot do that with someone, if you, during the interview, you don't feel that you will be able to trust that person to work remotely, then uh, like, don't hire them. Uh, if you realize you cannot trust anybody, then maybe the problem is with you and you need to work on being able to trust other people. But uh, otherwise, bear that, you have to be, uh, pay special attention during the interview process to make sure this is someone you can trust. Because if you hire them and you cannot trust them, it will be stressful for you and miserable for everybody. So definitely important. Last aspect of the interview process, evaluating people. Um, mentioned that a bit when uh, preparing for the interview process. But basically when you end up with evaluating, it's good that you have that all prepared in advance. Who we'll make the decision, but also how the decision is made. Um, as I said, yes, technical skill is important, but is there, you have to think about that, but for you, is there a minimum level? Basically that if someone is good enough to that point, we don't care if they are better technically speaking. As long as they reach that point, this is good enough for you. And then you put more emphasis on communication skills, trustworthiness, uh, just general cultural fit. Is it more important? Maybe it is, maybe not. If you are developing something that is really technically a uh, big technical challenge. Maybe you want to put more weight on the technical skills and say, there is no limit. We are willing to compensate. Um, we are willing to, to have someone that is a bit less good at communication if he's really rock, rock star on the technical side. But it's good to think about those trade-offs before you reach that point, before you start the interview process. So when you, you end up comparing candidates, you know, what you should be comparing them against. And yeah, maybe that person is a bit better technically than the other one, but communication was not that great. Uh, I don't feel I can trust that person that much. So I will go with the one that reached our minimum passing score on the technical side. So technically this should be good enough to do the, the job we're asking them. So there is no reason to, to lose on the soft skill and cultural fit just to get a bit more technical skill because will not make a difference for us. So you have to really uh, pay attention to that and decide that before, um, before you reach that point. So now you've done the interview, you get uh, someone join over time, multiple people join, that's great. And now you have to think about the onboarding process. Um, so again, for that similar to in office, but you need to prepare because onboarding remotely as its own a bit unique challenge. Uh, so you need to think about that. Um, it's a bit similar to the interview, but uh, also not exactly the same. So you have to think about what your process will be, which resource you will need, um, particularly for remote, that's important. And also who will end up being involved. Again, the idea is to prepare for that before, you, before the, day, the, the first day happens, because otherwise that would be bad, both for the company and for the, the new employee. So thinking about your onboarding process, your onboarding process um, many people think about it, that it starts on day one, but it actually starts before day one, especially for remote position. Um, when you start day one in, a, in an office setting, that's 
uh, as the new employee, it's relatively simple. You know where the office is located, you know which time you're supposed to be there. So you just wake up in the morning, you go there and see what happened. That's definitely fine. Whereas in a remote environment, maybe it's not the, um, maybe it's not the same uh, time zone as you. So you start at nine in the morning, maybe that person has already started five hours before. So if they just sit at home waiting for you to wake up, that's not a good start at all. So you need to start uh, thinking about your onboarding process, basically starting it from the time the person gets hired. Uh, of course, you're not asking them to work, but you, you can uh, uh, share your onboarding process at that point, uh, make sure the person know what will be happening, which day they start, um, all that stuff, and also prepare in the onboarding process frequent touch point and make it uh, explicit in the onboarding process that you share. So again, people know that, yes, I start on that day, I will be meeting that person, and also every other day, the first week, what will look like, the first two weeks, so especially, and also if it's a hybrid team, so you also have an office, people will wonder, do I start remotely or do I do the first week or two week in office? So sharing all that as soon as possible clears, uh, clears a lot of confusion. Now, as, you, as I've said in that, you have to, to, to share um, what people need. So, you, yeah, meaning you need, to talk, you need to think about that and prepare for that. So, do you provide a, a laptop? Do you provide a, a new desk, a new chair? Uh, do you ask if the person needs anything? Maybe if the person has all the equipment, you, you're fine, don't provide anything. Maybe it's mandatory. You just want to be sure everybody has a good desk, good chair. So you say, hey, like give a certain amount and please buy what you need for that. So again, doing that before day one, ensure that the person on day one has everything they need. Um, at the same time, you can share resource that they might want to read to prepare for the onboarding. Um, at, to prepare for the day one. So even if they don't read that, before because they are not your employee yet. So they might not want to waste their personal time uh, on your stuff, but at least on day one, whenever they start their day, they have a bunch of stuff they can read. They can already access um, uh, whatever system you have. So they already have access to their email, their calendar, um, GitLab, GitHub, whatever else you use. They have access to everything. So it goes back to, um, when I was talking about making sure people have a can do attitude, if you share everything up front before the day one, when they start, those people will not wait for you to onboard them. They will do that pretty much on their own, which will be much more efficient. Um, um, okay, uh, uh, so the last aspect about uh, the onboarding, so is who will end up being involved. So again, in office, you have a first person that will meet you the first day. Generally with remote, you will have the same. So uh, a short call, most likely with someone that can be the manager, that can be HR person if you're a large organization, could be a coworker, but whatever it is, making it clear before they want, what time it will be is much easier um, to, if it's decided up front. But you don't want to limit to that first contact. You also want to think about who will be supporting that person day to day? And you need to share that. So is it again, maybe the manager, maybe the coworker, um, is all the question you have, you ask that, that person, or uh, do you want to, to, to have it, um, like if it's HR related question, you ask, you ask the HR, um, anything else, ask the manager, whatever process you want to have, who need to be asked for what, you have to put that in your onboarding and make it clear on day one who that is. So they are not blocked from you, especially like if you are in an office, it's easy, you can just walk. And if the person is not there, you can pretty much ask anybody in the office. But remotely, that's not the same. So you don't necessarily know who you need to, to ask for anything. So make it clear, definitely uh, allow people to onboard much faster. And another thing that many people forget when you hire remotely is to think about is, how do you ensure that the new employee will end up meeting everyone? Again, in office, it's easy, especially if you have an open office space. Um, 
people will meet everyone just because they are there. So they will meet over coffee, over lunch. So after one or two days, you most likely have come, most likely have come across everybody that is there. Remotely, if you don't take special uh, step to make sure it happens, it will not. People will be alone at home and not interact with anybody else. So think about that. How do you want to do that? Do you want to do a huge all-in? Welcome, everybody present everyone. Uh, do you want to schedule a daily one-on-one -on -one with random other people? So over time, after a week or two, they end up having seen everybody else in the company or their team. Um, this is all stuff you should be thinking about and planning. Again, because it's really different from uh, an office setting. So now you've interviewed people, they join you, you onboard them, and over time you have a good team. So congrats, you have people. Now, initially everybody's happy, it's exciting, it's a new place, uh, but eventually the honeymoon will be over. And you want to make sure that the team still work well together. So um, there is a lot of resource online for creating uh, a good culture um, for your team, engineering or otherwise. A lot of that is also applicable for remote team. So I don't want to, do, to spend too much time about just the general stuff, but I want to focus on um, aspects that are really important for team culture that are much more important when you have remote team or hybrid team. Um, so that's three aspects basically. So one, I will be talking about forget the office. So um, uh, second thing about the communication, Communication is critical. I already mentioned that a few times, but remotely it's even more. So that's definitely important to keep that uh, during the life of your team. And finally, just be human. First thing, when I said forget about the office, um, it's actually that you, as soon as you have one remote employee, you should behave as if the whole company or your whole team was remote. If you don't do that, that remote person or remote few person in your team over time, they will just end up being set aside. Uh, there is kind of not much you can do about that if you don't consider your whole team to be remote. So um, you need to really pay attention to that. Uh, every time there is something that happened that is not available to remote people, it's a bad sign. So you need to make sure like every meeting is always remote. Uh, even if people in the office, you might say, just stay at your desk and do the call remotely. Don't be in the in the office so the people outside the office feel set aside. Um, and and a, a big reason for that is also that an office in a sense is kind of a huge band-aid uh, that cover a lot of different uh, problem you can have in a team. Um, they are not really fixed when you have an office, but they are most, much more or less apparent. If someone is slacking at the office, might not necessarily see um, or you might not pay attention because again, you just think if the person is in the office, they are not slacking. And if there is communication issue, meaning your communication channel are not good, in the office, you might get away because with this problem, because people will hear stuff around uh, and they will pass the message for the people. So even if your communication channel are not good, it's not such a big deal. But the problem is still there. It's just that you don't see the problem for as big as it is. When you are remote, the pro if you have communication issue, the problem is there. If you have someone slacking, uh, like, you cannot do much about it. So uh, this is all problem that office also have, but the office setting act as a band-aid. So if you forget the office and you tackle the problem themselves, it's much better. So you have to think about that. Um, also, if you forget about the office setting, then it opens a lot of other stuff you could not do necessarily while in office. So fully flexible schedule is something you can do much more easily or in a way, it's not necessarily easy, easier in itself to do, let's say go fully asynchronous or um, having fully flexible schedule. It's, not, it's never easy in itself. But the fact that you are remote, it kind of force you a bit into that path or at least make the opportunity much more appealing because you need to do something about that. So it's a good idea to rethink about it. So if you forget about how you do stuff in office and any issue or topic or problem or opportunity you see, you think from a remote perspective, 
first before thinking about what you usually do in the office, you can get uh, seize a lot of uh, opportunity from there. Um, the other thing about the really important to build a great uh, remote culture is to over communicate everything. So actually, I don't think you can actually over communicate. You can either not communicate enough or communicate just barely enough, but you cannot over communicate. So um, even in the, even in an office setting, actually. So uh, you really want for every message you have, just keep repeating it in different ways uh, as often as possible. So as long as nobody tell you, hey, you just keep repeating yourself, you should stop. Then yes, maybe you over communicated at that point. But until then, it means you're just communicating enough. So keep repeating the message to make sure everybody gets it. Um, and, and over time, really like understand, especially stuff around uh, culture, visions, and value, how you want your team to behave, and that stuff. The other thing about communication is uh, you have to think about asynchronous communication and synchronous communication. Um, in an office, it's mostly just synchronous communication, and you see that many tools uh, are based around that. But when you go remote, especially if you go across different time zones, asynchronous become much more appealing, if not mandatory. So you have to think about the trade-off between the two. I mean, they both have uh, advantage and disadvantage, so it's not, not saying go full asynchronous communication. So there is good value in doing a live meeting with people with a camera. Um, but you need to think about the trade-off. So what needs to be done with live meeting? Um, what can be done just with a, a chatbot asking status update? What can be done uh, by just sharing document or like asynchronous chat? So you need to think about that and really put that in place. And whatever you decide, you over communicate it because people will like, take time before people get into those the habit you want to to put in place. And finally, um, and like. In a way, everything I've said so far, like, all comes from that. So to build a great team culture, you have to remember that we are just human in the end. So nobody is perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Uh, we all different. We don't communicate the same. We don't understand the same. Um, uh, and so it's easy to make miscommunication. So it's easy to make communication mistake. So you need to be empathetic with others so don't assume other people uh, when you get a mistake if someone make a mistake or like, someone send you an email or say something in slack uh, don't take it personally don't assume that that person is trying to like getting you and like attacking you or whatever just take a step back and consider that is most likely just miscommunication and assume the best in other so Again, we are just hum we are all human. Mistakes happen. Don't make a big deal out of it. Um, it's good to take that into perspective and try to what can be to think about what can be done to prevent the mistake in the future. But putting blame and uh, arguing over Slack, being angry that that leads to to nowhere. So um, and maybe the other person was not even angry at you again. So it's just miscommunication over text message, which is super easy to happen. So but if you keep that in mind, that everybody make mistake, again, we just human. 90% uh, of the communication issue won't exist. You will be able to build a great team culture because like, you assume people have good faith, you assume people are trustworthy, you put trust in the process that build your team, in the process that you add for the interview, the onboarding, you assume things will go fine. If you do that, that goes a long way to, to, to ensure you have a, a great culture down the road. So that's about it. I uh, will stop the share. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thanks, Laura. <laughs> I think rounding out the first day of the conference with this talk is so on the nose and appropriate given everything that's happening. Um, and that was a great talk. It seems that there's a few questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I see them now. I see them now. So I'll just um, start from the first. Uh, 
Phần thực sự Okay, so I um, think the first question is um, experience for remote team in same time zone versus different time zone. Um, yeah, so it, it is much uh, definitely much easier if everybody in the same time zone. Um, like a lot of challenge comes from different time zone. I mean, if you if you have someone like the extreme case, so 12 hour uh, difference between two people, he, like, he, unless one of you want to compromise on his daily schedule, you will not have any uh, crossover uh, overlapping time. So video call will be a problem, for example. Whereas if you are all in the same time zone, you can, you can still try to do as much stuff as possible asynchronously. But if you feel that there is miscommunication, if you just keep arguing about something and the point doesn't go across, people don't understand, you can say, hey, let's just jump in a call and solve it right now. So if you are in the same time zone or relatively close, definitely as you are. Um, just a personal experience, I've worked, uh, I think the further I've add was maybe eight hour difference. So it was not too bad. We always had like, we're able to get a few hour uh, um, uh, overlap, but um, that was a larger company. Right now where I'm at, we are fully distributed, but uh, just we're limiting ourselves to basically Canada and the US. So we have just three time zone to cover. Uh, we know in the future when we grow, we want to open to, uh, the rest of the world, but it's a startup. There is already enough challenge just with building a product, brand new product, uh, building a startup. So we decided, hey, if we can get the people we need just within Canada and the US, let's start with that, like build a product and we can expand to, to the rest of the world once we've tackled a, a new company and new product first. But, um, but other, like some other startup, they start from day one with across the globe. So it's really a matter of preference, but there is definitely a uh, more challenge if you, if you have multiple time zone. Okay, so uh, I think the next question is uh, handling family inter interrupting at home. Do you have a system? Um, so it's kind of funny because so, uh, usually I work from home so yes, there is family interrupting, uh, not going behind the camera, but um, just from noise, especially if in a video call. So I have four kids and they are all homeschooled. So they are in the day in the house pretty much all the time or frequently enough. So yes, there is noise. But the thing is, if you have multiple people working remotely, nobody care much. And most of the time, um, I never had anybody say negative comment about that or really care. Usually it's me that I feel like, like many things remote, it's you that will feel bad about that much more than other people. Other people don't care. I mean, other people don't care about you basically. <laughs> or so if there is an interrupt, if you have a kid that come and interrupt, you might be bothered about that a bit because you think of the image you're projecting and whatnot but the other people will most likely just find it funny anyway. So they don't really care. Um, it's kind of, a, I mean, similar anecdote. Like when you start working remotely, you go to the bathroom, you are worried that someone will try to call you or reach you while you are at the bathroom. That's kind of silly because if you are in an office, of course you go to the bathroom when you need it, that's fine. But when you work remotely, the first few times you say, oh, what will happen if I do that? But again, it's just a you thing. Like nobody else will, will panic about that. So you can call them back once you're done and everybody will be fine. So I think um, it's not as big of a deal as uh, most people think. That said, this is for an environment where remote is, is welcome. If it's not a fully remote team, maybe it's a hybrid team, but people are aware and happy with that. I've been in a company where I was the only one person remote in the company. Um, 
the company didn't want to hire remote people. Before I joined, they didn't want that. And when I was there, they didn't want to hire other people working remotely either. I was able to convince them to do that for me. But um, so with them, I had to take a bit more, I was a bit more careful about that because I, I knew they were kind of trying to, any negative thing they could say about remote, they would pick on that. But I think in that case, you're much better to use that as a clue to, you should start looking for a job elsewhere. Like most company will not be like that. So if they are, if you work remotely for a place that want to take that as a negative shot against you, I mean, use your time to find some place, somewhere else to work if you can. So, but otherwise, um, should not be such an issue. Um, can you talk about the struggle transitioning from office to remote? Is it true some people are not just cut out for it? Um, I think that will, so transitioning from office to remote, uh, like anything new, there is some challenge. So you have to give you some slack and give you some time to adapt. Um, don't be too hard on yourself initially. Like there will be time where your internet goes down in the middle of a call. Suck, but that's life. That's not, that's not such a big deal. It happens even when you are in office anyway. Um, so like give you some slack about that. Um, otherwise, uh, more and more now, there is a lot of resource online that you can read about, about that, spe that exact case. So uh, transitioning from office to remote, uh, how to, uh, um, I've seen some, uh, some article and a webinar about like, it's your first time remote, what you should be doing, what you, what you should be um, thinking about. Actually, um, I know there is a Remote How, so that's a, a company called Remote How. They do some, some uh, like training and resource around uh, working remotely, and they do have a, a, a course that include that. So, like, what to think about if you work remotely? How to think about where you will be? Do you want to work in your house? Do you want to go to a co-working space? Uh, do you need to buy furniture? Do you need to think about lighting? And like, whatever, all you could have in mind, they cover that. So that might be a good idea to. To, to look at that, um, mostly to give you a bit more assurance about that and think about stuff you might not think about. Um, yeah, uh, da, 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 otherwise, uh, yeah, some people not cut out for it. I mean, likely, yes, there is likely some people not cut out for it. I'm pretty sure there is some people that don't want to for a lot of reason, like, it's easier to slack if you are in an office than if you work remotely, because the only way to know if someone work and is productive remotely is by the output they produce, how much they help the team, stuff like that. In the office, most place, it's just, are you in the office? Yes, then we assume you work. So if you are the kind of person that spend a lot of time in office slacking, then yeah, you will not like working remotely at all because people will see that you're not working at all. So in that case, you're not cut out for remote. Um, otherwise, I think even if you are super extroverted people, person that you like to be surrounded by other, you can do that remotely. You, you don't need to work from home. Um, I mean, even in my case, like, like four kids at home, but if I wanted to, I could go work at a, a co-working space. So or from time to time, but currently I actually went to a co-working space because I didn't want my kids to like yell while I give the, the talk. So uh, I came here. But uh, if you want to just be able to see a lot of people anyway, and you go to uh, like open co-working space, go to, to Starbucks, um, like go at the beach, whatever. So I don't think there is, there is otherwise someone not cut out for remote work. So if you, if you are productive, if you actually work, when you say you work, then any challenge you might have are easily um, uh, doable even if remotely. So I don't think, 
a reasonable person should not be cut for remote. Um, yeah, someone says train your family to not be available while you work. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I do. I, so in my, my office, my office in the house, uh, I don't have a door, it's open. That said, like, as, like even baby, like they learn as soon as they walk, they cannot, the floor is not the same in the office than on the other side of that, uh, of that um, uh, door opening. So they learn that you don't cross that. You don't go in the office when, when daddy is, as, is at set and is working. So they might yell, they might cry, cry. So people will hear it, but they will not walk in and walk on the keyboard and, and, and whatever. So yeah, you can I mean, train, but it's like, it's not like, like anything in life. Like you, have a, you are a parent, if you have kids, you have to, to help them grow. So that's just part of life. And it can actually even be good for them, like seeing their parents working, seeing how things work, that stuff, that's kind of cool. It's like bringing your kids at work, but all the time. So that's kind of good, good experience. Um, over communicating, create noise. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think, yeah, in the office, if you communicate a lot, yeah, so uh, over communication create noise level equivalent to classic of a, uh, open office plans. Any advice on this? I think this is true only if you use, I would say bad tools, but maybe that's not really the correct word, but stuff that keep notifying people all the time. Um, so yes, if you get notification every time someone like post something in Slack, wherever, even if it's not related to you, then yes, it's a lot of noise. Uh, if you have notification on all the time for everything, it will, I can, maybe even worse than open office plans. That said, fixing open office plans is much more complicated than just using communication tools that allow you to use notification in a better way. Um, so I, I, I don't use Slack that much now, at least for work, so I, like the, uh, on the Slack channel for this conference and, and another um, like open group stuff on Slack. But so basically I have Slack notification disabled because I don't use that for work, so it never interrupt me. Um, but that was the reason why we decided uh, to not use Slack because Slack notify you, I think, kind of too much, I mean, either too much or the default with Slack is to notify everybody kind of too much. Um, so we've used other communication tool. Um, it, there is a few. The one we had used was called Twist. It's developed by the same company that create the uh, Todoist app. Um, so in Twist, for example, like, uh, Every message you type, you always see who will be notified. Uh, and the default is to not notify everybody. So everyone that you can, it's easier to set a culture where every time you type a message, just pay attention to who get notified and remove people that you are not directly talking to. They will still see the message anyway, because when you go to the tool, you can see everything you've missed, even if you were notified or not. So you can catch up but you don't get as much notification. So if you use tools like that, then I don't think over communication can create that much noise because you just um, catch up on that at your own, uh, at your own pace when you, when you want that. So you can, um, you can just work four hours straight and then take your message. So I think twist do that too. You can snooze notification for some time. Um, Right now we are trialing Basecamp. So instead of using Twist, you might want to use Twist to Basecamp. Basecamp has some kind of some new good feature around that too. So you can set office hour in Basecamp. Basically, uh, like everyone can set the hour and outside those hours, Basecamp don't send notification. Instead, they will send um, uh, a digest, digest message when you start again the next day. So there is no over communication, but you can also like pause notification when you want to focus on something. So there is a lot of tools that are good for that. So you just have to 
to like, like everything, like just don't go to the default of what pe in office people use, like search for what remote team are using and there might be better solution for that.